We're on. We're very on. There we go. Better. All right, now everyone seems very far away. But thanks for coming. Those of you who could have gone to kindergarten class but came, decided to come here instead, uh, you know, thanks for the encouragement. Uh, so we, uh, my plan is to finish the book of Hebrews today. And then uh, next week, Lord willing, uh, we'll start a, um, just a kind of a temporary project of a few weeks um, at looking at catechism, looking at the Baptist catechism and what catechism is and why should we should even look at it. We'll talk about that hopefully next week. Um, and uh, do that for a few weeks uh, while we get ready for the, the next series after that. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, today, I, it's the, the Sunday school last night just titled Benedictions, but we're going to look at the benediction in Hebrews 13 and then maybe talk a little bit, discuss perhaps even, if I can use such a strong word uh, in a Sunday school class, discuss even maybe a little bit about benedictions um, in general. So, Hebrews 13, we've come to the end of the letter, and the author is uh, just finished Hebrews 13 with, with two different kind of final um, concluding thoughts, one about uh, what proper love looks like and what it does not look like, verses 1 through 6, and then uh, those who have rule over us in spiritual things, um, verses 7 through 19. And now in verse 20, he gives a benediction, and it reads, 20 and 21, reads like this. Now may the God of peace, who brought again the, from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And there is technically a doxology added to the end of that benediction. Um, but uh, they're the, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so. Um, so benedictions, just to uh, introduce that topic here. What do you think of uh, when... I'm distracted by colors, I'm sorry. Uh, what... Um, when I when the Bible uses my my version says benediction right above verse twenty, or I I said the word. What comes to your mind? Uh, did I accidentally hit Google? So, uh, what uh, what comes to your mind when I uh, when I with the word benediction? What? Conclusion. It's what? Conclusion. Conclusion. Okay, Pastor. A final blessing. Okay, a final blessing. So conclusion, final blessing. What comes to my mind is just kind of a picture of the Catholic Church and monks. Okay. Just like the image. <laughs> so Alethea gets a mental picture of the Catholic Church and monks in particular. But she's not sure why. Did you mean priests, not monks? Monks and priests. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. monks, priests, clergy. Summary. Okay, summary. It's a it's a, a strange kind of a prayer. It, it's okay. it's a form of a prayer. Okay, so Pastor first said it's a strange kind of prayer, and then he said it's a form of a prayer or a form, form a prayer with form. No. Do you mean like it has a certain shape, or? I feel like going back to my office. No, no, you don't. You don't have to. Uh, or, or do you mean it's formal? No, it, it is a kind of prayer that is very specific. Okay. It is used as a final blessing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it is a very specific kind of prayer used as a final blessing. That's what he said. That's pretty good, actually. That's not a bad definition at all. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you said that, and you'll see why in a little bit, um, if you don't go back to your office. 
Okay, so the short definitions, if we can do that, um, the shortest definition is simply a blessing, and it comes from the Latin, which literally means to speak well of some of somebody or to someone. Okay, so so if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, but from the dictionary number two, an invocation of a divine blessing, usually at the end of a church service. Okay, so it is uh, by the word invocation, it's a prayer. And it's usually a prayer that a minister says for the congregation when the service is concluded. Now, what, what's interesting in, in uh, studying this um, for in pre pre preparation for today is I thought, well, when did this when did this start? When we look at church history, when did churches um, start using that? Now, just to clarify, and I'll talk about this later, but we don't have, we don't use one in our, pastor doesn't use one in our service. Okay, so, but when did it start in, Christian, in Christianity, broadly speaking? Does anybody know when it started? When the, when the Christian church, very broadly speaking, uh, started using benedictions at the close of their services? Can you even take a wild guess? You want to go ahead? You want to... A wild guess? <laughs> I would have said since the beginning. Okay. Right, um, was, that, was that Carl? Oh. I was in agreement with Joanne. Oh, it was you. That's what I would have said if you cornered me again. Okay. So, Joanne, Joanne and Pastor says from the beginning. Anyone disagree? Anyone agree? Okay. The fascinating thing is, uh, it is. There is no record of any church. Now, we don't have in the New Testament a recording of a church service in full. Okay, so we don't have an example in the New Testament of the church service ending with a benediction. Okay, so that, just to clarify that. But uh, any record that we do have of a church service, now, you remember what the fancy word is for a church service? Anyone remember what the fancy word is? It's liturgy. Okay, that's, the word liturgy just means church service, but sometimes it, get, it got kind of appended towards, you know, like Catholicism or something, and so sometimes people have a negative uh, connotation with it, but it really doesn't have any negative association to it. It's just the word for church service. It's, a, it's an old Greek word for church service. Okay, so the, the liturgies used to be written down way back uh, and in the early church, and they were kept. And those uh, liturgies that we have, all of them have a benediction. We, we don't ever have a time in church history that we know of where there isn't one until mid-19th century America in some denominations. Okay, Baptist denomination being one of them. Um, where the liturgy was given up. Um, it also started, it also, the history of the benediction actually pre goes back to the Old Testament. So in the Jewish liturgies that we have, predating uh, Christ's birth, uh, we also have liturgies at the ends of the services. So this is kind of a, I don't know, fun fact to know and tell. Um, that the benediction has always been part of the, the service. Um, so looking at the, the, the Bible, or the ancient, oh, I just said that, look at that, ancient tradition. Um, and, the, and geographically, this is another thing that's interesting. When the Christian church uh, really started to spread, you have to, we know a lot about Christianity in, in Jerusalem and Israel from the New Testament documents. We know a lot about it in the Greek world as Paul spread it through Galatia and, and into Greece, Macedonia, Corinthians, you know, the Corinthian letters, Thessalonian letters. Those are all, you know, Greek cities. And then to Rome, so the, the letter to the Romans. Uh, we, we have, we know fairly well about early Christianity in that period of time. But Christianity also split, spread down to Ethiopia in Eastern Africa. So there's always been a strong Christian influence in uh, East Africa and in Ethiopia. Well, I guess modern-day uh, Eritrea. <clears throat> so that area of the world. 
anyway, all the traditions that we have, from North Africa to East Africa up to Rome, all of those traditions also have benedictions. Okay, so some biblical examples. The, the key, the, or the, the big one, the one that most people know from the Old Testament comes from, does it, anyone know? Besides, besides our A student in the class. Who's that? <laughs> uh, pastor, do you know? Six. Yeah, it's numbers. Uh, number six verses twenty through to, through twenty six, and this is repeated in the Psalms uh, with a slight change on it. But this is known sometimes as the Aaronic blessing because this is Moses blessing Aaron and Aaron's uh, sons as the priests in the temple. And it says, "The Lord, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you." And, and this is why we say it's a prayer. Because the person saying it is praying that the Lord would do this for the person to whom uh, he is saying it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance. And there's another, I think the one in the psalm says, the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And uh, there was a great musical arrangement of this done by John Rutter, and you can probably find that on YouTube, I would guess. It's worth listening to, and it's obviously it's short. Uh, it's just a couple, I think two and a half minutes long. But uh, it is, uh, it's a fantastic piece. Anyway, so this is uh, the most common one in the Old Testament. Like I said, it was repeated in the Psalter, and it was commonly given not just to Aaron's people, but at the end of the um, end of the services in the uh, synagogues. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, in the New Testament, we have quite a few. Here's an example uh, from 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, Pastor talked about 1 Thessalonians uh, during the ser uh, sermon today. And most letters of Paul, most letter, actually almost every letter, there's a couple of exceptions in the New Testament, end with some kind of benediction. Uh, 1 Corinthians does. Verse 23, it's very short. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And then you could include verse 24. May love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. But the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. It's a common, um, common benediction in the New Testament. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, he says, uh, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with you all. That's, of course, Trinitarian. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit mentioned uh, in that one. Um, yeah, let's see, not that one up there. 2 Corinthians. So, as I mentioned before, we don't have a record of a, of a church service ending with a benediction in the New Testament, but we do have these at the end of these letters. Um, let's see, Ephesians ends this way, Ephesians 6.23. Um, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Okay, so that's another short one. The longest one is in Hebrews 13. And um, just before I forget, in, I think it's Luke 24. I probably should have had this on a, on a slide. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. So Luke 24, verse 50. There are some that would point to this as a benediction, uh, but we don't have the contents. Okay, so Jesus is about to ascend to the Father. He's died, he's been buried, he's been raised again. He's met his disciples in, Gal in Galilee, the 11. Uh, and he's about to be carried up into heaven. Verse 50 of Luke 24. 
Uh, Luke says, then uh, he, that is Jesus, Jesus led them out, the disciples, as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So that final blessing before Jesus left, uh, some speculate, was Jesus leaving a benediction on his disciples. Okay. So that's a little bit about benedictions in general in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, and the history. Uh, we'll look a little bit at Hebrews 13 in particular now, and uh, this one, so we can understand it. And then we'll talk... Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Then we'll talk about whether we should do that um, in our services. Okay, maybe that'll be the discussion part. Okay, doing okay in time. All right, so Hebrews 13, verse 20. Uh, starts, it says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you. So, there's a lot of words in here. Uh, now, it starts with the word now, and that's actually an important word. Uh, the word now, and the, re the, the reason this is kind of an important word is, uh, this, this letter was written in Greek, but it's, this verse is very much of a Jewish Hebrew construction. And that word now is breaking off everything that had been said previously. I am now going to tell you something new and different that, that, that's different. Okay, I'm starting something new. So now we're going to talk about this. So that word now is actually kind of significant. It shows that we're doing something different. And what Pastor mentioned earlier, correctly, that a benediction has a certain form to it. It's a prayer that has a certain style or structure. As the other ones that we looked at, you could kind of see that. And uh, this word now is actually part of that. Okay, so what, what we're doing is a little different. So now, may the God of peace, who brought again... Uh, the dead, our Lord Jesus. Now, it's kind of hard to stop. But the focus is on, the prayer is asking that God himself would do something for those upon whom the blessing is being bestowed, upon the hearers. And notice then, there's a, there's a whole bunch of uh, phrases here that tell us more about God, that bring to remembrance to, for us very specific things about God. So there is, in a sense, as he goes through this, when he, he reminds us of these characters of God and the things that God has done, he is, in a way, reminding us of all the points that he made throughout the letter. He's going to bring those back to remembrance by looking at them through the person and the work of God. So, first of all, God is a God of peace. And if you recall, that God of peace is making peace through his blood. Jesus made peace through his blood. And that peace is our peace with God. So we were enemies with God, and through Christ's blood, we can now have fellowship with God face to face. Uh, we once had our backs turned towards God, and now we can adore God. We can face him with love and adoration. So this God of peace, he's the one who has broken down, the, Paul says in Ephesians, the wall of hostility between us and God. So he is the God of peace. So the author of the book of Hebrews wants us to remember that. He wants his original readers to remember that. God is a God of peace. God is the, is the one who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Okay, he brought, again, so the resurrection of Jesus. He brought again, uh, he brought again the dead? No, I'm missing a word. Am I missing a word? Oh, I am. That's terrible. Because that's kind of an important word. That's almost um, not orthodox. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
brought again from the dead. This is why it's important to have your Bibles in front of you. Uh, our Lord Jesus. So this is talking about the resurrection uh, of Christ. God is the one who rose, who raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, and of course, there's Jesus said that Jesus raised himself from the dead and all that. But uh, God is the one who did this. He's the, the God who raised Jesus from the dead. The God who can raise the dead. Okay, let's just make it generic for just a moment. Uh, is a powerful God. In fact, he is the most powerful God. There is no other God in the universe who can raise people from the dead. And there are a lot of people in the, in the world who think they can do miracles uh, by their own power, but they, they don't raise the dead. Okay, they don't do that. It is only God who does, who does that in the sense in which Jesus was resurrected. And that uh, because Jesus was resurrected by God, uh, again, we know that his sacrifice was the one that was accepted. And again, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to study that in a lot more detail. Why is it that we have a guarantee of our resurrection? Because Jesus was resurrected. How do we know that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by God? Because Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven. So that gives us assurance. So God is the God of peace. He's made uh, a way of peace for us. How do we know that? Because he raised uh, from the dead our Lord Jesus. Uh, the God of peace is also the great shepherd of the sheep. Now, last week we talked a lot about pastors. Of course, pastor and shepherd is the, the same word, two words for the same thing. But this is the only place in the scriptures that refers to God as the great shepherd. And, uh, and, and so God is the great shepherd uh, of the sheep. So he is the ultimate pastor. And, uh, and as we talked about, those who have preached the word of God to us in the past, those who preach the word to, of God to us now, in our relationship to them, I brought out then that uh, their authority comes, their teaching and leadership comes from two places, the word of God and how they live out their Christian life before us. And like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So that's what our pastors do. They say to all of us, follow me as I follow Christ. And, uh, and so we do, uh, verse 17, uh, or we should. Um, we, won't, well, we won't rehash that, but uh, so, so we should. And God is called here the great shepherd of our sheep. Now, if you've been following along in pastors' uh, emails, morning devotionals from through Acts, uh, pastors been teaching kind of on this, where John chapter 10, uh, Jesus instructs his disciples. And he says, yes, Jewish, the Jewish people I've come to save. And this is my, and he kind of refers to himself as the pastor. In that case, the shepherd. And I have sheep that are in this fold that I've come to call out. But I have other sheep in other folds that I'm going to call out also, and I'm going to bring them out into one giant group. Now, I don't know if you, how many of you have ever seen an actual shepherd working with actual sheep? Have you ever had a chance? A couple? Yeah. Okay, maybe you raised the sheep or something? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Ruth's like, yeah, we, we know sheep. Okay, so I was in Germany one time, and uh, there was, uh, it was not really in the middle of town, but it was kind of like a park. It actually reminded me of Smith Park in, in Montevideo, uh, where it was kind of closed off, had kind of a dike on one side, and a... Uh, and we call it a culvert on the other side. And there was a little bridge over one end of the culvert, and there was a bunch of sheep in there grazing. And while we're just walking, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, we were just walking, the pastor, uh, the pastor, the shepherd, came, came over the, the bridge, and he gave a whistle, and like half the sheep turned and took off towards him. 
And then he got them over the little bridge and wherever they were supposed to go. He comes back and he gives another whistle. And I was trying to pay attention. Because I was like, well, is that whistle different than the other whistle? Kind of like when pastor whistles before Sunday school and we all take <laughs> off into our own, little, our own little paddocks, you know, for Sunday school. And, um, and he gives another whistle. And about a third of what was left of the sheep, they look up and they take off for him. And he leads them over the bridge. So now there's, you know, there's less than half the sheep left. He does this like four times, and then finally there's no sheep left in this little pasture. Uh, they're all gone. But they're, they're evidently different sheep that were distinguished somehow that needed a different call to, to bring them over into the other fold. Uh, so I didn't understand all that. I didn't get all the, the history of that. Um, I was just observing. But Jesus says in John 10 that he, very similarly, he's calling people to himself. And some are Jews and some are not Jews. And he's got these different folds and he's bringing them together. And it's as, as it were, he were whistling for them to come. So, the point that you all know is in Acts, Acts a lot is explaining how this actually, or demonstrating, how it actually happened as you, as you go through the early church history, starting in Jerusalem and working your way out to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9 and 10, and then John's, most recently John's disciples, um, John the Baptist's disciples. And so you have that um, uh, analogy. But anyway, I thought it was kind of along these lines. God is the great shepherd of the sheep. So the God of peace, who raised Jesus, brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Okay, so this is uh, another phrase, and I'm going to come back to this one, um, because it modifies the verb, which is next, equip. <coughs> So the prayer is, may God equip you. And there's a lot of things that tell us about God, and then there's going to tell us some things that tell us about equipping us. So the prayer is, may God equip you with every good, uh, everything good that you will, you will, may, you may do His will. In other words, may God give you everything that you need to accomplish His will in the world where you live today, uh, where I live today. Now, I'm saying that now. I mean, the author wrote it for them back then. But one of the characteristics of benedictions is they're somewhat timeless. There's nothing different about the Hebrew people that uh, this letter was written to than that this could be applied to our lives today. So may God equip you with everything good that you may do as well. Uh, and what is that? Working in us so that God would work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Okay, so may God equip you with everything good that you may do as well. What does that look like, doing his will? Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So when we live out our lives accomplishing God's will that he has set up for us, then we are uh, doing what is pleasing in his sight. Now, how many of you would say, well, as a Christian, I would love to be a person who does that which is pleasing in God's sight in my day-in, day-out world. Whether I'm going to school, whether I'm going to work, whether I'm going grocery shopping, whether I'm driving to Florida, whatever I might be doing, I'm doing that which is God's will for my life, and I know that by doing God's will for my life, I'm doing what is pleasing in His sight, and this prayer is saying, may God give you everything you need so that you can do that, because we can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it on our own because we're, we're sinful people. And so the, the blessing, the benediction, the prayer for God's believers, uh, or for, for Christ's believers, is that uh, the God of peace would equip us with everything that we needed. Now, how do we know God can do that? Well, he's the God of peace. He's the God who raised Jesus from the dead. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. This is who he is. This is what he has done in the world. Certainly, he can do this. 
Now, I want to take a moment and talk about this one phrase, which is a little bit more uh, ambiguous. You, to equip us by, it says in the, in the ESV, the blood of the eternal covenant. And now that preposition is tricky. Uh, but, oh, I don't have the preposition up there. Oh, I can, I'll switch back. Because this one I have the right preposition in there. Uh, by the blood of the eternal covenant. So the question is, uh, what does it mean that he will equip you by the blood of the eternal covenant? And what is the eternal covenant? Uh, so, <clears throat> you remember that uh, in Hebrews 9, we looked at some detail about Jesus' death and his blood. Uh, and how in the old covenant with Moses, Deuteronomy 24, this is a little bit of review, in, uh, sorry, Exodus 24, not Deuteronomy 24, Exodus 24, uh, the Jewish people entered into covenant with God, Moses mediated that, and Moses took, uh, uh, made an offering, took the blood, and he sprinkled it on the people, and he sprinkled it on the book, and Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant. Okay, so the blood of the covenant was signified the fact that the covenant was made. And the covenant was uh, God is their God, and they and Israel is his people. Okay, and they entered into a formal covenant with one another. Okay, so then in Hebrews 9, we talked about how that, the author used that same imagery to talk about Jesus. And the reason for that is, um, Jesus in Matthew 26, for example, says at the Last Supper, he says from the, the grape juice, he says, this is the blood of the covenant. Speaking of the new covenant. So the covenant here, the blood of the eternal covenant, is kind of summarizing, as one, one person says, kind of like a summary, summarizing all of, the, all of that teaching in this one little phrase, the, the blood of the eternal covenant. So it's talking about Jesus' blood, what it did in Hebrews chapter 9. And if you recall, it did two things. The blood of Jesus uh, made peace with God possible for all humankind okay, by taking away our sin, our debt that we had in Adam. And it secured the making of the new covenant with Israel in the future. Okay, so this is Hebrews chapter 9, and it does two things that are independent of each other. Okay. Um, so the blood of the eternal covenant. Now, that, that covenant there was the, is the new covenant. And here it's called the eternal covenant. Okay, so why eternal covenant instead of new covenant? Okay, so again, more review. Towards the end of the letter, the author was making a strong point about the old ways, the old Jewish ways, the old uh, using sacrifices in the temple and the priesthood. You remember all of those discussions? A lot of them have been recorded. You can go back and listen to them if you want to. But he was making an argument that those things are temporary. And what God wants us to focus on in this day and age is that which is permanent, transcendent, eternal. So this is why we don't have uh, temples that we, we meet in today. This is why we can worship in this building, we can 